For young Angelinos, it is unimaginable to think of Los Angeles, currently the second biggest city in the U.S., as a rural piece of land in which the skyline ceased to exist. Los Angeles, one of the most diverse cities, has rich history with different cultures contributing to its development. One side is not always told, however, and that is of the Mexican-American War, where U.S. usurped over half of Mexico's land and how oppression contributed to segregation which created ethnic enclaves where people found freedom to express their culture in the outskirts of the city. Mexican Americans occupy East Los Angeles where pivotal moments have occurred and important culture sites exist. But these stories have often been ignored because they have been unconventional to dominant society. East Los Angeles which has the largest Mexican community in the United States, has a history that has often been masked under the bustling development of the city as a whole. In 1781, a group of 11 families comprising of 44 Mexicans settled in an area along a river with a rich agriculture landscape. Felipe Neve, the governor of Alta California and leading founder of the new settlement named it El Pueblo de Naresta Señora La Reina de Los Angeles, now known simply as Los Angeles. During the Spanish-Mexican era, Los Angeles was developing into a town reflected of the culture of the Mexican settlers, which included the construction of a central plaza and Catholic church. In May 1846, the Mexican-American War broke out which lasted until 1848 and led to the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe, which resulted in the acquisition of about half of Mexico. Along with the Mexican settlers that were already here, the dissatisfaction with the economic and social conditions in Mexico from 1900s to 1930s caused many to emerge north. The proximity of Los Angeles and the rich agriculture region together with the positive information about wages and living conditions in the U.S., attracted thousands to the area. Once here, Los Angeles Industries had formed a dependent relationship with the local Mexican labor force who were willing to accept low wages, irregular working hours, and poor working conditions, making them ideal employees for the construction and transportation industry. For the Mexicans migrating to the U.S., between 1900 and 1930. The plan was to earn some money in the U.S. and then return to a more stable political and economical situation in their homeland. Many realized, however, that such a return was neither so easily accomplished nor so desirable as they found prosperity and opportunity in Los Angeles. Soon, they began to establish a Mexican and Mexican-American community in East Los Angeles. The strong love of life and a sense of family that flourished in the Mexican spirit resulted in an increase in the number of churches, schools, social and political clubs, fiestas, and other public cultural celebrations. The onset of World War II brought even more new Mexican immigrants into the U.S. After many workers in the U.S. left their jobs to serve in the war, the U.S. needed cheap labor so the U.S. and Mexico reach agreement on a new program to import Mexican workers. As many as 100,000 Mexicans a year were soon being contracted to work in the U.S. It was called the Basquiero Program. This new wave of immigrants settled in East Los Angeles, which had established itself as a center of thriving Mexican culture traditions. Over time, the Mexican-American community of East Los Angeles grew to become the largest Hispanic community in the United States and the second largest Mexican group outside of Mexico City. After the Mexican-American War, under the Treaty of Guadalupe, it stated that land grants would be upheld. But that was not the case. U.S. government did not recognize the grants and the Angles took over the land. A few Mexicans did keep their land grants. 
In the case of the grandparents of Sacramenta Lopez, her grandfather, Esteban Lopez, built a home in Boyle Heights from help of Los Angeles Ayudamiento. His father, Claudia Lopez, was the mayor of Pueblo of Los Angeles in 1826. When Esteban died, Petra Villarola sold her homestead to Andrew Boyle. Esteban gave his son Chico a huge portion of the land who was the father of Sacramento. George Cummings, a settler who arrived in the early 1860s, ended up marrying Sacramento Lopez de Cummings. In 1889, they began building Cummings Block and Hotel on Sacramento's land. It was being built in the corner of First and Lopez, now Boyle Avenue. Chico Lopez and George Cummings were key in transforming Boyle Heights from a farmland to suburbs. After more than 100 years, the Cummings Block still stands. Cummings Block includes affordable housing and also the Boyle Hotel. Across the Cummings Block, there is the Mariachi Plaza de Los Angeles. At Mariachi Plaza, Mariachi magicians have congregating here and playing music since the 1930s. A lot of Mariachis have resided in the Boyle Hotel or known as the Mariachi Hotel for decades. Mariachi is a musical form that originated from Jalisco. Men and now increasingly women wear the traditional chato outfits. The musical instrument used are violins, horns, and accordions. Mariachis can be found in restaurants, baptisms, weddings, and quinceañeras. Many know where to hire magicians, and that is in the Mariachi Plaza. Mariachi Plaza is considered a shape of sight because this is where workers in the informal economy congregate while waiting work. Owners of the hotel, the nonprofit East LA Community Corporation, are committed to making significant improvements to the living and working conditions of the magicians while preserving the historical character of the building. As Professor Miguel Gandert say, a vibrant mariachi community at Mariachi Plaza has emerged over the past 75 years with the Boyle Hotel, known as the Mediachi Hotel, as its center. This is the most fragile form of a tangible culture, which evolves organically from the roots of a community. There will be a viable self-sustained community as long as the Mediachi magicians are able to live here and as long as the plaza remains a place where people from all over Los Angeles know that they can find these artists. On October 24, 2007, the Los Angeles City Council voted to adopt the Boyle Hotel Cummings Block as a historic culture monument. Despite this, recently realtors still seek to transform and dislocate the community by proposing to build a shopping center at Mediachi Plaza. a nivel musical, pues ese lugar es uno de los pocos lugares en USA que se le parece a Garibaldi, a San Juan de Dios, a Guadalajara, porque es un punto de reunión y un punto de partida para los mariachis. Podemos contarles la historia de la de esta comunidad cuando se fundó de todo eso. Eh, ¿De cuál? Desde la plaza, la plaza y, plaza. y del, del Hotel Boyo. Eh, el Hotel Boyo es, una, es un, el Hotel es un edificio antiquísimo. Cuentan que en sus tiempos era Hugo Gansers. Eh, era el, la, el tráfico de, de vinos, creo que ahí también se fue en la parte de abajo hace muchos años. Prohibition. Cuenta que era un cementerio. No, 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 no. La plaza de aquí, no sé, creo que fue una donación de personas de Guadalajara. Y llegó un mariachi, llegó otro, se fue haciendo tradicional y ahora se ha salvado de muchos. O sea, ha querido destruirlo varias veces, pero pues la tradición puede más que muchas cosas. Hay mucha gente que depende más de este lado. La gente que viene y quiere, como dicen en el sign, gentrificación y que... Gentrificación, pues, en este país es el poder económico es bastante. Y el poder económico se antepone a muchas, muchas cosas. No me extrañaría que esa gentrificación se haga, se haga realidad en pocos años. 
la forma está que están construyendo ahí para hacer los condominios ¿no? la, la, nada más simplemente recomendarles que si les gusta la música mexicana que sean en el lugar exacto Ruben Salazar Park, located on Whittier Boulevard, is the site of the Chicano Moratorium March in August 1970, which was the largest anti-war demonstration in U.S. history. 30,000 mostly Chicanas and Chicanos demonstrators marched to Salazar Park to protest the fact that Chicanos were being disproportionately drafted and killed in the Vietnam War. Upon their arrival, the demonstrators were met with intense police brutality, which resulted in four deaths and hundreds injured and arrested. The riot started when the owners of the Green Mill liquor store called a complaint about theft. Deputies responded and a fight broke out. Cadets from the nearby Sheriff's Academy were called to the area and marched into the park. One of the fatal victims of the protest was journalist Ruben Salazar, who was covering the march. Salazar was an established figure, being the first Chicano journalist to cover the ethnic group while working in general circulation media. He served in the LA Times and was a news director for a Spanish language television station. He focused on the Mexican American community in East Los Angeles. Many of his pieces were critical of the Los Angeles government's treatment of Chicanos. Recording the last moments of Salazar's death, he was resting in the Silver Dollar Bar after the Vietnam War protests became violent. According to a witness, Salazar had just sat down to sip a quiet beer at the bar, away from the madness in the streets, when a deputy fired a tear gas projectile at a crowd which went into the interior of the bar, hitting Salazar in the head and killing him instantly. His death deeply impacted the community his voice and position as a journalist was a vehicle to reveal the depressing treatment of Mexican Americans. The story of Salazar's killing gained nationwide coverage in the Rolling Stone magazine. In 2006, a building at California State University, Los Angeles was named after him. In 2007, the United States Postal Service honored Salazar by issuing him on the first class rate postage stamp. A plaque honoring Ruben Salazar is mounted in the entrance of Salazar Park, which was once called Laguna Park. Salazar Park is recognized as a historic cultural site that occupied a space for Mexican Americans to share their common concerns to promote change. The mural at Salazar Park also continues to preserve the historical event in 1970. The mural is located on the exterior wall of the Ruben Salazar Park Recreation Center. Paul Botheo's mural, The Wall That Speaks, Sings, and Shouts, is an energetic expression of movement and emotion in brilliant ranges of color. The 25 height by 50 width mural reveals many symbols. The artist depicts groups of marching men, women, and children who will not be detained by a small police detail. Journalist Ruben Salazar is included in a small blue portrait on the right side of the mural. Ruben Salazar Park is a community hub, which continues to be a space for families to gather and enjoy the historical rich culture that exists in their environment. Unlike the Silver Dollar Bar, which was replaced with small clothing shops and businesses, Salazar Park still stands and continues to be a colorful park in the heart of East Los Angeles. How long have you been living? Have you been living in this area for a long period of time? Uh, for over 40 years. For over 40 years. Um, do you know what occurred on this park? Wait, what? Do you know like what happened at this park? Or? Uh, there was a, a, a rally going on in the 70s. And, and what happened is uh, a lot of people and children were here. A lot of people were people. What happened was some guys that went and stole some beer from that corner of the ticket store over there and they ran over here. And that's how the cops got involved, they ran in here. And they started hitting people with the batons and stuff like that. And then they started throwing uh, 
tear gas. So that, that started the whole riot here. And then from here it went all the way down to Atlantic Boulevard. And uh, they were already after that Ruben Sellers article because he was uh, working for the Los Angeles Times and he was uh, he was uh, exposing them. You know, for uh, police brutality and the murders. Did you guys say anything in that movement? Uh, you know what? It's hard to say because uh, the the things that happened weren't supposed to happen because it was a peaceful rally, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, it probably would have been positive if it wasn't for those guys running in to the crowd after they stole that beer. You know, that's what turned it from a positive to a negative. So I, I don't know what everybody got out of it, but there was a lot of uh, people that were very upset behind it because they, they were you know, throwing those uh, tear gas containers at, at the kids and stuff. They were hitting the, mo the mothers, the fathers, everybody with the batons. And uh, so they, they got pretty upset, and I don't, I don't blame them, you know. But it, right there is where it turned negative. So if there was anything positive towards it, that took away from it. You know, but it was more than, it was supposed to be positive, but uh, it ended up pretty negative. No, I, I wish that people would understand that. Without the education, you're not going to go anywhere. You know, you're going to get stuck on drugs, and you're, you're going to stay that way because it's a, it's a vicious cycle of getting addicted and it's just jail, go to jail, come back, and it's the same thing over and over again. They're not thinking about any kind of education or bettering themselves. You know, and then a lot of okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you guys. Uh,